episode 32 of the Tea and Possibilities podcast. I'm Nikki and this is a podcast all about knitting, crochet and making all the things here in North West London. You can find me online on Instagram at hippie underscore Nikki. I'm also on Ravelry as Nikki Hippie and if you look for Tea and Possibilities under the groups tab you will find our Ravelry group there too. I would like to say a massive welcome back to any of my returning viewers and to any new viewers Welcome, thank you so much for checking out the podcast and giving it a shot. I have to admit guys that with the return of the absolutely beautiful sunshine is the return of the pint glass. <laughs> Again, it is absolutely boiling. I've got a t-shirt on, I'm wearing shorts. It's a gorgeous day in London town and I am all about the hydration. That didn't stop me having a massive mug of builder's tea this morning with my breakfast but I will probably not be having any more tea until I have a nice big cup of green later on. Gosh, it feels like not so long ago I was actually talking to you because instead of my every other week schedule, I actually podcasted last week, which is, as I said then, because I am going away in a couple of days to Italy, which means I won't be able to podcast this weekend coming. So I thought I would do two in a row and I will podcast again when I get back. But I know what you're all thinking. You're all thinking, did I win? Did I win that beautiful skein of Flamingo Legs from Stranded Dye Works? I will be answering the winning question in Knit and Natter at the end of this episode, but I'm not going to keep you hanging till then to find out whose winning question it is. So, I would like to congratulate the lovely Elaine, who is Apple Pie on Ravelry. You have won the beautiful skein of Stranded Dye Works Flamingo Legs. Please send me a message on Ravelry uh, with your full name and address and I will get that sent out to you um, hopefully before I go away, but if not, as soon as I get back. Now we've got all that important information out there, let's move on to Whipped Up. I have to admit it's been a busy old week here. Um, there was the work summer party this week. I went dressed as a pineapple. No, there is no photographic evidence, thank goodness. <laughs> but I had a great time and there were lots of meetups this week as well, which meant my making time was at a minimum. So I have yet to block my hats and I have yet to get my buttons sewn onto my Hortensia cardigan. It is blocked and I'm hoping to do it this evening or before we go away, fingers crossed. But that does mean there's not a great deal to show you, so it's gonna be a fairly short one this week. But let's start with my current favourite project. This is the Sockhead Hat by Kelly McClure. It is knit out of my beautiful treasured skein of Le Bien Ami in her merino high twist sock in the Le Littorel uh, colourway, and I love it. As you can see, the last time I spoke to you, I was still on the ribbing, but I am now on the stockinette body of the hat. And it is just like a sock. You just go round and round and round and round. And I know that a lot of people would find that boring, but I actually find it really nice. <laughs> I've been picking it up on the tube. Um, I've been doing it at work. So I, I actually, um, we had a last minute trip to see Buckingham Palace yesterday because we realised that Rich has never seen Buckingham Palace, even though he's lived in London for a few years now. So. Um, off we went and I was knitting this on the tube while I went to see the Queen. Um, yeah, it's a really nice easy knit. I've got a lot of stockinette left to do. Um, I think I've got more than twice what I've already done left to do. But it's it's going along quite well. I'm just knitting on it while we watch um, QI of an evening. Um, I believe that we're going to watch The Sword in the Stone this evening, which is one of my favourite films of all time, and I will be working on that then. I would heartily recommend this pattern. This is a great uh, beginner's hat pattern. If you're um, new to knitting in the round, this would be a great opportunity to learn because you do rib and you do stockinette. So you will learn the two basic stitches and you'll be very, very good at them by the end. Next up is a brand new cast on. Um, this is a very sad looking new cast on because I am literally two rows in. Um, I have been using my favourite hat cast on, the German twisted rib cast on. And yes, 
I have yet to get the hang of having um, the right amount of long tail to do a long tail cast on with. I just can't seem to do it. I've been doing an inch per the amount of stitches, um, which always leaves me with too much, but a centimetre per stitch is too little. So if anyone has got a magical formula, that would be amazing. I um, didn't want to rip this out and give it another go because I have been doing an awful lot of typing at work this week. Um, I suppose no more than usual. <laughs> Um, but I've been very, very tense in my shoulders. I've had a lot to do before going away on holiday. So my hands have felt um, a little bit crampy. So holding my hand to do the um, long tail cast on like this made it a little bit uncomfortable. Knitting is fine, but just holding it in one place for too long made it a bit uncomfortable. So I didn't want to redo this. And I don't think I have to worry about running out because so far, um, I've been using Madeleine Tosh. This is Tosh Vintage in the Candlewick colourway. And all my hats so far have been Madeleine Tosh and I've had a significant amount left over, which is great for swaps and for my cosy memories blanket. So I'm not too worried. But yeah, this is, you probably can't tell funnily enough, but this is the Fuego hat by Justina Lukowska. Um, this is the second Justina Lukowska pattern that I'll be knitting as part of this hat kick. Um, the first one was the tied knots pattern that started it all. And this is a really cute pattern. It's got a pom-pom on. I don't know if I'm going to make a pom-pom. I'm not a big fan of making pom-poms. I might buy one because this is going to be a birthday gift. Um, but it's got some beautiful cabling that looks like flames up each side. And it's just gorgeous. And I think it's going to be really wearable. Um, unfortunately, this is not really a colour I can wear um, because I'm so pale. I kind I mean, I don't know if you can see, but it tends to reflect on my paper white skin. <laughs> so I tend not to wear this colour because I don't know how it would look next to my face. I would love a jumper in this, like you wouldn't believe, but I just don't think it would suit me. However, the person I'm making this for is brunette. Um, quite olivey skinned compared to me, so I think this is going to look absolutely gorgeous. So yeah, that's all I've been working on this week. Um, I feel a little bit <laughs> of a disappointment, particularly after talking about imposter syndrome last week, but it has just been an incredibly busy week, um, just trying to see people before I go away and all that kind of thing. And I have enjoyed the knitting that I have done, which is the main thing. One thing I did put a little bit of work into this week that I wasn't going to show you, but I think I will, as there wasn't much else to show you. The Shanghai Stripe Saga continues. <laughs> My friend is off to Shanghai um, while I'm in Italy, um, so I won't be able to see her before she goes. I definitely won't be able to give her this blanket before she goes. This is the halfway point, so I'm almost finished the next colour repeat and then I'll have three more to go so I feel like I could I could finish this by Christmas she's coming home for Christmas so we'll be able to give it to her and she can make the decision of whether she wants to take it with her or just have it at home um, I don't know whether it'd be a pain in the bum to pack frankly <laughs> I might offer to post it out to her if she would like it but it's not going to fit in her bag but yeah it's getting there slowly but surely. I did the bulk of this bit over a very rainy few days because it was actually quite nice to have this laying across my lap and hooking away, keeping me warm while it poured outside. And then it got really, really hot again and I've put it down. So I see a lot more work on this on cooler days, but um, I'm not gonna stress out too much. I've missed the deadline. I'm just gonna enjoy working on it. I have to say that being down to three works in progress feels really, really good. I've got my big blanket going on in the background and I'm alternating between a more complicated hat pattern and a simple hat pattern. I am going to get my hat done and then I will be casting on for a garment, but in the meantime I will be swatching for it. And I do plan to cast on my colour affection um, in the day or so before I go away to Italy because I want something to work on on the plane. And I've set myself a Christmas deadline for that, so I kind of need to start it sooner rather than later. 
I don't know if you remember, but I actually talked about making Rich some mittens. This was way back when we still hadn't gotten, gotten rid of our flat in Portsmouth, so the background was very different back then. I have the yarn, he chose um, just a very sheepy grey yarn. I have the pattern, which is the Care Ligaments by Isolde Teague. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but I'm doing my best. <laughs> And all I need to do is measure his hands, figure out size and get going. And I would quite like to give him those for Christmas as a little stocking filler. So that is two things that I'm going to be trying to make for Christmas. Not counting um, the fact that I have another hat pattern that I'd quite like to cast on. I have the perfect skein of yarn for it and I think it would be absolutely gorgeous for um, a friend of mine who is Rich's brother's girlfriend. And I think it would look stunning on her, so yeah. All of a sudden I seem to have a lot of Christmas gift knitting to do, which was never my intention. I decided to make the colour affection for my mum for Christmas and suddenly I've gone, oh I could finish those mitts and oh there's that hat. And don't get me started on the fact that the um, Skeindir Knits um, beautiful colour work mittens that I'm planning to cast on when I get back from Italy. I'm kind of thinking I would like to give those away for Christmas as well. Uh, to go with the hat that I'm making um, to give to the same person. And I'm wondering if this is madness. It's August and you know, some of these are fairly small. The mittens and the hat shouldn't take too long. The colour work mittens might take longer. The colour affection probably will take a very long time and it might end up being an IOU. But yeah, I don't quite know what happened because I don't ever really knit for other people. And then this hat kick and the very, very rainy weather that made me want a lot of blanket and hot chocolate time and left me feeling quite Christmassy. Like I had that autumnal feeling of, oh, pumpkin spice and planning for Christmas. So yeah, I think it's been a combination of quite enjoying knitting things for other people and the weather. I may change my mind about this because obviously Italy's going to be sunny, it's gorgeous here, so... Maybe the Christmas gift knitting madness will pass. Is this nuts? Am I crazy? I've knit things for Christmas before, never a significant amount of things. I tend to knit more for birthdays because they're staggered. So yeah, am I mad? Should I do this? There's also the fact that Pom Pom arrived yesterday and I haven't had a chance to have a proper flick through it um, because I just haven't had time yet and I like to sit down and really enjoy pom-pom and of course it's beautiful and of course I want to knit all the things so maybe maybe the autumn issue of pom-pom will make that decision for me and yes I will be reviewing pom-pom when I get back from my trip but now let's move on to knit and natter we are racing through the episode today <laughs> But this is what happens when I do it every week because then I never get as much done to show you guys. Uh, so I really hope you don't mind. Uh, also, I hope you don't mind. I was really interested in some of the questions you posted on the 2000 subscribers giveaway thread, uh, which really is a mouthful and I should have come up with something catchier. But um, I really enjoyed some of the questions you asked. A lot of you asked very knitting based questions. I had questions about books, what I did for my degree, how Rich and I met. And sometimes I do wonder what to talk about in Knit and Natter. So if you don't mind, I would love to refer to that thread later on and eventually I would kind of get through all of your questions, I hope. So do tune in in future episodes because you may see your question answered then. In the meantime, the lovely Elaine, who is apple pie on Ravelry, again, don't forget to Rav message me your details so I can post that out to you as soon as possible. She left me a very interesting question. She asked, if I could sit down and knit and drink tea with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Now, obviously the first person that popped into my head is JK Rowling. <laughs> Um, which when I told Rich, he rolled his eyes and said, oh, of course. And it is a very obvious answer for me because I do think she is an incredible woman. She is incredibly talented. Not only um, am I a fan of the Harry Potter books, I really enjoy her work as Robert Galbraith. 
I think she's an incredible person when it comes to um, her work with charities. She set up Lumos and she's very politically outspoken, which I do admire because, you know, putting your head above the parapet is a scary thing in the social media age we live in. But she's incredible. I think hanging out with her and talking about what's coming up in the Robert Galbraith series would be fantastic and also getting a real, real deep dive into her experiences um, as Harry Potter exploded, her thoughts behind some of the characters to see if they align with what I have instinctively interpreted, that would be really really cool. But because that's a very obvious answer and because I can never limit myself to just one, let's make this a bit of a knit night. One of the next people that I thought of was Mary Anning. Um, Mary Anning was one of my childhood heroes because when I was a child, I was obsessed with dinosaurs. I absolutely loved them. I had posters up, I had the magazines, I had the books, I had these little like build your own glow in the dark dinosaur skeleton things. I loved them. I saw Jurassic Park when it came out in the cinema. Um, I believe my mum had to convince the guy at the cinema that I was going to be absolutely fine, and I was. It didn't scare me at all. I just loved it. I was. I remember sitting in the front row and just going, because it's amazing, and it still is amazing. It still is one of my favourite films. As a child, I was looking everywhere for female role models in the paleontology area. And I couldn't really find any because this was the pre-internet age and you couldn't just Google and find a living, breathing, amazing doctor who happened to be a woman, um, unfortunately. The only dinosaur-based heroes I had were Dr. Alan Grant and Dr. Ellie Sattler. So I did a little bit of research in the library, in the encyclopedias, and I came across Mary Anning. Mary Anning lived in the 1800s in England. She lived around the Jurassic Coast. I will link to more information about Mary Anning um, in the show notes, but there is also a great novel by Tracy Chevalier called Remarkable Creatures, which um, features Mary as a character. Not necessarily historically accurate, but it was a fun read and I really enjoyed it. But yeah, she lived in the 1800s along the Jurassic Coast and I thought she was amazing. Why did I think she was amazing? Because she found the first complete skeleton of an ichthyosaur. You can actually see this in the Natural History Museum, which I did a couple of weeks ago, um, which is probably why she's fresh in my mind. And as a woman, she wasn't allowed to join all of the scientific societies that should have been her right as an incredibly intelligent woman who was making these really significant scientific discoveries. She was consulted quite regularly, but she was never really given in her own lifetime the respect and adulation that she deserved. And I think that's probably why I became a bit of a feminist at a very young age, because I really didn't think that was fair at all. Um, and I loved her and I thought she was amazing. I remember being about eight years old and reading her biography. Um, yeah, I was a massive dork. And I still think she's incredible and um, this little wall just about her in the Natural History Museum is one of the bits that I always revisit because I think she was amazing and yeah, I have always really admired her. Someone else that I would love to join my knit night would be Gregory David Roberts. Someone asked if Harry Potter was my favourite book of all time and I will answer this more in depth um, in a later knit and natter. Um, but while Harry Potter is incredibly formative for me, and I have a lot of affection for it, it is not my favourite book of all time. Shantaram by Gregory David Roberts is. It's about that thick, and Rich is currently reading the sequel, The Mountain Shadow. Um, we read Shantaram in about 2012, I insisted that he read it and he loved it too, and I didn't realise there was a sequel. <laughs> Um, until very recently, so Rich is reading it first and I will be reading it after him. And I love it. It's uh, about a guy who escapes jail in Australia and runs away to India and about his adventures there. And it's an incredible book. Um, the, this guy, he knows how to write. I can still remember passages from this book so clearly. There is a passage relating to grief that is so piercing and so real. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible book. 
Um, he does not do any interviews anymore, um, no video interviews, no written interviews. He has asked for things to be removed from the internet because he wants his art to stand for him. I have since discovered that he's released an ebook version of The Mountain Shadow with, I believe, like nearly 200 question and answers, interviews, which he has said is one of the last interviews he'll be doing, um, potentially ever. Um, a lot of really interesting stuff about his process. Um, he's published things that he cut from the final novel um, uh, with information about what draft it made it up to. and. He's an incredible writer. Um, to this day, I don't know how much of Shantaram is based on his actual experience um, because he has he has removed himself from the internet and is trying to let his work stand on its own. I've heard that it is based quite a lot on, on his own experience and it's amazing. I couldn't recommend it more highly enough. There is um, a lot of violence, there is a lot of um, you know, not safe for children, content including drugs, violence um, and some graphic scenes, but it's it's amazing and it. <sighs> I've always wanted to go to India and this book made me want to go even more. It's just perfect on so many levels. There are a few uh, people from history that I would absolutely love to hang out with and have a bit of a knit and natter with. Um, the first is probably a bit of a cop-out, but Anne Boleyn. I love the Tudor period, I read a lot about it, I have a lot of opinions about various things that went on then and my opinions change quite regularly. Um, but I would love to have a sit down with Anne Boleyn and see what she was really like, because, you know, you hear so much about her and there's the camp that is very violently Catherine of Aragon and there is another cat that is very violently for Anne Boleyn and you know the real woman was probably somewhere in between and I would love to meet her and see just what she was actually like. While we are on the subject of queens, um, Elizabeth Woodville and Elizabeth of York are two other women that I would love to meet. Again because because of the period of history in which they existed not much was written down about women. Elizabeth Woodville was famously the wife of Edward IV and the mother of the princes in the tower. She, um, as legend had it, stood under a tree with the sons from her first marriage, a widow, this beautiful widow, and that is how she caught the eye of Edward IV as he rode by. Um, and she was considered a witch in her time. She was disliked because she was just a beautiful woman of very low standing family. Um, her father and mother weren't, you know, lords and ladies. Um, she brought no great wealth. She brought no great allies to this marriage. Um, it was very much a love match as far as we know. And because of that, you don't really understand who she was as a person. Was she kind? Was she cruel? Was she funny? Was she, was she intelligent? I would love to meet her to see just what she was like. Maybe she was a witch. <laughs> her daughter is somebody else that I would love to meet. Elizabeth of York was married to the conquering Henry VII, the father of um, Henry VIII, um, at, after he won at the Battle of Bosworth. Um, their union united the houses of York and Lancaster and brought an end to the Wars of the Roses. The reason I would love to meet her is again because very little is spoken about her. Um, again, she was a very beautiful woman. She was the mother of Prince Arthur, King Henry VIII um, and the sisters Mary and Margaret. And she launched that Tudor dynasty to, to a great extent. But <laughs> there is a lot of rumour about the fact that she may have been lined up as a potential wife for her uncle Richard, um, who was defeated at the Battle of Bosworth. Uh, there is also talk that Henry VII was the one to have killed the princes in the tower, in which case, what was that like to have been married to the man that killed your brothers, um, you know, the rightful king? So yeah, I would love to sit down with her because neither of these women, um, including Anne Boleyn, um, committed their innermost thoughts to paper. Or if they did, we don't have them. And I would love, um, if I can't sit down with them, I'd love to read their diaries. <laughs> the last person I would love to have a cup of tea with um, 
is Shakespeare. I am a massive Shakespeare nerd and we will cover that again in another question um, which was about what I did for my degree. But I love him. I love his works, I love going to the Globe and if I could go back in time to around 1600, maybe even 1599, get involved with you know, ferrying the globe across the river and rebuilding it and just sit down with a tankard of beer and say, come on, where, where are you at? What are you working on? Talk to me about it. Talk to me about where you get your inspiration from. Where do these words come from? That, that would be amazing. That would just be, yeah. In fact, if we could do that after getting to stand in amongst the groundlings, um, probably the heavily scented hanky, <laughs> while looking up and watching the very first performance of Hamlet, say, that, that would be amazing. If I could, that's probably what I would do if I met the doctor and he was like, where in all of time and space do you want to go? I would probably just be like, well, there are all these people from history. I have a lot of questions for them. Um, so if you could just pop me um, first to Shakespeare, then to Anne Boleyn, and then to Elizabeth of York, um, that, that would be great. <laughs> I wouldn't care about space, I wouldn't care about aliens. I'd just be like, take me back through English history, I'd love it. Well, that was a very rambly and historically heavy knit and natter. Uh, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Um, but that is something that I love. Um, history is one of my great obsessions outside of knitting. So I will be answering some of your questions late in later episodes, so do keep an eye out for that. But in the meantime, I hope you have a lovely week, and I will see you after my holiday for another glass of water, cup of tea? We shall see. <laughs> Take care, have a lovely time. Bye!